today's World Insight with Tian Wei, the BPRK's weekend missile test, and worries over food security. What now for Korean Peninsula diplomacy? And green is in at the recently opened Beijing Horticultural Expo. Stories of nature's beauty and bounty. And welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. Last year, DPRK leader Kim Jong-un pledged to stop testing nuclear bombs and long-range ballistic missiles. On Saturday, multiple missiles have been launched from the DPRK into the East Sea. Analysts suspect they were short-range missiles, so not technically in breach of Kim Jong-un's pledge, but definitely intended to test Washington's negotiating position after President Trump walk away from what he described as a bad deal at his Hanoi summit with Kim Jong-un in February. For more, let's take a look. The DPRK test-fired several missiles on Saturday. The launch happened amid stalled negotiations between Pyongyang and Washington. But the U.S. president insists the two sides will reach an agreement. On social media, Mr. Trump played down the test, saying, I believe that Kim Jong-un fully realizes the great economic potential of North Korea and will do nothing to interfere or end it. The White House says it is following Pyongyang's actions and will monitor the situation. Meanwhile, Japan's Foreign Minister Taro Kono spoke on the phone with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Japan says the DPRK's projectiles didn't pose a threat. South Korea had been keen on easing financial restrictions on the DPRK, but struck a tougher tone the day before the launch. The logic is very clear. The sanctions are there because of North Korea's nuclear and, and missiles program. And therefore, there has to be some visible, concrete, substantial action uh, on, on that track for the, for, for the global community to, to, to do anything about the sanctions. Nuclear diplomacy on the Korean Peninsula has been in limbo ever since Mr. Trump walked away from what he described as a bad deal at his Hanoi summit with Kim Jong-un in February. The DPRK leader and Russian President Vladimir Putin recently discussed reviving the long-stalled six-party talks that include Russia and China, though the U.S. has ruled that out. The only thing that's clear is that the DPRK needs money and fast. The United Nations released a report on Friday warning the DPRK has cut food rations to their lowest level ever for this time of year and may be forced to further slash them without international aid. It is estimated that uh, about 10.1 million people, around 40 percent of the population, are considered to be uh, food insecure and in need of urgent uh, food assistance. The UN says the severe food shortages follow what its key food agencies describe as the worst harvest in a decade. U.S. Special Representative for the DPRK Stephen Began will travel to South Korea and Japan next week for talks aimed at finding a way to break the nuclear diplomacy deadlock. So, what would it take to break the nuclear diplomacy deadlock on the Korean Peninsula? Let's turn to our panelists. In Washington, D.C., Jenny Town, a research analyst at the Stimson Center and the managing editor at 38 North. Welcome, ma'am. In Washington, in Boston, rather, Dr. Jim Walsh, a senior research associate at MIT's Security Studies Program. Good to see you, sir. And last but not least, in Beijing, Yang Xiu, Senior Research Fellow from the China Institute of International Studies. It's good to have the three of you who are experts on the issue. Start with you, Ms. Tao. You've been doing research about the DPRK for a long time, doing exclusive projects about uh, what's going on inside the country. What do you make of the mixed picture? On the one hand, the launch, the test, on the other, the drought, and also the food security issue. Well, I think we have to be a little bit careful of, of how we portray the test that happened over the weekend. Um, a lot of talk is about how it's sending signals to Washington 
And in fact, um, you know, the North Koreans had warned ahead of time that this was really a possibility, these type of reciprocal measures that are geared towards Seoul. And again, still trying to push um, Moon Jae-in to be able to maneuver, um, to, to be able to bring about um, better results in the inter-Korean agenda, which has been stalled, largely because of a lack of cooperation from Washington. Um, but this puts South Korea in a very difficult position as to how do they respond going forward um, since they have not gotten cooperation from the U.S. on either the peace agenda or the economic agenda to be able to make good mm. on their half of the commitments in the inter-Korean accords. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's always unfortunate uh, in the, as, a, as a result of sanctions, as a result of the dwindling trade and the dwindling business, that it makes it more difficult for the most vulnerable populations in North Korea um, to have food security because a lot of um, where they were getting food before was not always based on the harvest itself, but the, you know they had been importing a lot of foodstuffs and people were able to purchase of course. Um, the foods within the markets. Mm. And so you know the the effects that sanctions are having are affecting the most vulnerable populations first, um, way before anyone in the elite are really going to feel that impact. So it's very important right now, Mr. Walsh, to closely examine what exactly happened when it comes to the tests and also the launches nature. What do you think, technically speaking, is the DPRK breaching the earlier commitment? How serious are these launches and tests? Meanwhile, what kinds of capabilities does it show? Is it more a political gesture, a tactical gesture, or is it more a strategic approach? Mr. Walsh, a series of questions, but I hope you will be able to help us to shine some light <laughs> on them. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Certainly. Well, I, I think uh, it's not a violation of, of the commitment. Now, we haven't seen that commitment in writing. That hasn't been released to the public. But the assumption has been that North Korea said, uh, and certainly in most of its actions, that as you said at the top of the show, would not conduct a nuclear test or a long-range ballistic missile test. And this was not that. So they are not, they have not yet violated uh, the commitments that they gave to President Trump. And this is not the first time they've done this. They've also uh, shot off short-range projectiles in the past, at least once before. And then when they get frustrated, they've also sort of, in a very public way, as Jenny knows from the satellite uh, photography that they use at 38 North, sometimes they'll do work at a missile site or they'll do work at a nuclear site to sort of wave a flag and say, hey, we're still here. Uh, you know, and we need to make progress. The uh, Ch Chairman Kim gave President Trump a end of the year deadline by the end of 2019. Progress had to be made or else. He didn't say what or else was. Mm. But I think this is all part of, as you would suggest, political communication. It is signaling, it is pressuring, uh, it is uh, a, a direct message mm. to President Trump that you know, if things don't progress, then we'll go back to the bad old days uh, of testing. And I think Jenny is right to point to the importance and the difficult bind that South Korea finds itself in. But these tests only weaken, anytime North Korea does something like this, it only weakens President Moon. It doesn't really help him in, in his uh, predicament because uh, domestically he's right. seen as weak, uh, but he can't make any progress on his inter-Korean a relations project as long as the U.S. stands in the way. Right. And so it's just bad news for him. But Mr. Walsh, I want to just to dig a little bit more about a, a statement you made that, that sure. the DPRK is giving the United States the end of the year. What is supporting this statement, Mr. Walsh? Uh, which reference are you referring to the end of the year, so to speak? Well, I think, I think Kim Jong-un said that in his New Year's speech or soon afterwards. Or, or maybe it was after uh, ha Hanoi. But yes, it was the Chairman Kim who had said uh, through KCNA that, you know, the clock is ticking here. Now, the question is, who ha who's more vulnerable? Who has more leverage here? On the one hand, yeah. you know, the, the North Koreans, as you rightly point out, are, have, are facing tough economic uh, and, and food insecurity problems. On the other hand, the president doesn't want to lose what is his only, essentially his only foreign policy achievement, which is to stop the testing. And so each side is playing this game of chicken. My own right. preference is that they get back to the negotiating table. And, and unfortunately, that has, not, has yet to happen. We're talking to our allies. 
We're not the U.S. and North Korea are the ones who need to be talking. Okay, and Mr. Yang, you've been listening attentively to your two other colleagues. Yep. Now, here's the thing: China, of course, play a big role in terms of trying to make peace on the Korean Peninsula. We're going to talk about that a bit later. But what is your judgment and assessment of the latest situation? Are these all tactical moves by both sides? You heard about the tests and the launches coming from Pyongyang, in which. Uh, the chairman Kim personally monitored, according to the latest media report. Certainly, that is some kind of gesture when he's personally involved and want to make sure that message is being heard. Meanwhile, Mr. Yang, uh, from Washington's perspective, you heard the other side, uh, together with the allies such as Japan, trying to brush off, saying it is not necessarily significant the tests uh, recently by the DPRK. Uh, so, are both sides doing tactical? moves and rhetorics for now? Mr. Well, Young? I would say by this way, uh, it is a really technical move or technical action, however, containing a strategic signal. Technical uh, action means this test, no matter it's a political missile or something else, the key phrase is the short range. Short range means no violation of any any rules or resolutions by UNIC. So mm. no violation, and that is not uh, provocative. However, strategically, the latest uh, intensive military actions, drills, or uh, long, uh, uh, tests really send a signal indicating Pyongyang is, uh, is uh, doing or preparing two options. Mm. One option is the previous one, say continue to uh, continue to dialogue with the U.S., but on the other hand, p start to prepare for the other way. Just mm -hmm. like uh, the top leader Kim Jong Un indicated repeatedly, they are trying to seek for the so-called new path. Now, no one uh, understands clearly what does it mean by new path. Right. However, the new, the latest uh, tests really indicate something uh, compo composed. Uh, for the new past. That means they may return to the previous uh, style of uh, engagement, you know, confrontational engagement with the United States. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's strategically winning in a way yep. to be vague in terms of the phrase that you use so that there will always rooms to maneuver, of course, uh, for later use. Uh, Mr. Yang, I want to continue to ask you another question. Mm -hmm. That is, um, you see about the possibilities uh, between the United States and the DPRK. And yet the timetable, despite of the fact that Mr. Walsh talked about the end of the year as being shown mm -hmm. through the DPRK side in the New Year uh, speech, uh, but to what extent about what at what time that timeline, at least to the public, is not known. Uh, so what can we understand about the nature of this? Are both sides also having the possibility that they try to show to their domestic constituencies through whether the actions they've taken so far or the rhetorics they've been spreading so far. Remember President Trump said in his latest tweet, no matter what, he said, a deal will be done. That's what he said. Uh, Mr. Yang, your thoughts? Well, I think uh, both Kim Jong-un and the President Trump have been on an irreversible path towards the diplomatic solution on the nuclear issue, especially domestic politics. For Trump, they have input, uh, he has input a lot of uh, political capitals uh, in engaging with Kim Jong-un. And uh, by the same token, Kim Jong-un has input a lot of political capitals uh, to engage with the United States. For example, he has declared no need to more nuclear tests and the more uh, ballistic missile tests. Mm. And they even uh, removed the nuclear test side. And uh, that situation has made extremely difficulty for Kim Jong-un to return to mm. the previous one. That is why both President Trump and the Chairman Kim want to keep the dialogue door in open. Yeah. So that is the situation. However, for Pyongyang, they said, we can wait till the end of this year. I think that is their true intention. So before end of this year, that's not propaganda. That's right. not tactics. That's a true intention. Say before end of this year, 
it's worth for Pyongyang to wait for the opportunity of re, uh, resuming uh, dialogues. Right. For the next year, for Pyongyang's calculation, U.S. will uh, fall in a, a mass a presidential campaign right. and a lot of uncertainties. At that time, there is no worth talking with the, you know, the existing president. So uh, I think the time window of opportunity window is short. Is, is short Probably yeah. it is at the end of the year, before the end of the year. And Ms. Tao, I want to go to you about that too, about the timing and about the time schedule that the two sides have to at least in the hearts come up with something, if not in paper showing to the public. Ms. Tao. Yeah, I, I think we, you know, as much as Kim Jong-un has said he would give the U.S. until the end of the year to come to the strategic decision um, on the U.S. CPRK side of the equation, the problem is, is I think our timetable is actually much shorter. Um, you know, what North Korea has done now by doing these series of short-range um, tests that they've done over the past few weeks now um, and sort of the, the missives that they've given towards Seoul, um, the problem is now is that, you know, this is all very, it makes it very difficult now for South Korea to justify um, continuing to postpone yeah. um, military exercises, the joint military exercises. And so I think, you know, if we go back to um, uh, the Ulti Freedom Guardian the way that it was done in the past, back right. in 2017, for instance, this summer, it's going to reverse a lot of the political goodwill and a lot of the, the, um, the intention right. um, to move forward. It's going to reverse a lot of that. A path so that has been you know, traveled we, we earlier may not problems. be the path that can be taken anymore as circumstances are changing. It seems that you're suggesting yeah, it, that now. Uh, but, but you know, I want to yeah, further ask you a question related to, to that, to which is that. what Mr. Walsh mentioned in his statement earlier, which I think extremely interesting and uh, intellectually uh, discussable. That is um, whether both sides are matching or measuring each other's capability of leveraging. Because we all know, of course, in the negotiation, the more you can leverage, the better. However, in a negotiation, it is also true if both sides have one common goal, there could be differences in the capabilities of leveraging. But as long as they have a common goal, both sides will work toward that, despite of the fact they have different capabilities. And eventually, nobody would feel losing out in that negotiation, and most likely that common goal will be achieved. Now, here's the thing, Ms. Tao. Whether the two sides are still trying to measure their leverage capabilities toward one another or they are willing to work toward a common goal, I think that is the issue here. That, that is what we are really talking about, Ms. Tao. Well, I, I don't think they necessarily have the same common goal. What we saw in Singapore, for instance, the agenda that they laid out mm -hmm. Um, there are different priorities within that. And I think, you know, the, the North Koreans prioritize the relationship, the peace agenda, mm. um, the removal of hostile policy, whereas the U.S. is emphasizing the denuclearization side of stuff. So because of that, um, I think there's a lot of miscalculation going on. And I think, you know, what the North Koreans are doing now, mm. as much as I think they believe that it builds their leverage against um, South Korea and against the U.S. by yeah. challenging them to, um, you know, not go back to the relationship they had before. In fact, it pushes them in the wrong direction because, again, it makes it very difficult for either side to justify continuing an air of good political goodwill as I they see. move forward, even though they've invested so much capital in it. Mm. So, Mr. Yang, so the two sides do have a huge difference yep. in terms of what the goals, the ultimate goals are, or at least the combinations of mm -hmm. goals are. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yang, do you agree with that? No, uh, I prefer looking the difference at this way. Okay. At the level of ultimate goal, no difference. Mm -hmm. They have got a consensus say full denuclearization. Both Singapore meeting and the Hanoi meeting repeat this consensus. All right. And the, the, the difference lies in the approach or the path. I summarized the different paths for North Korea and the U.S. at this way. For the United States, 
uh, uh, declaration first, uh, verification second, and the dismantlement third, lastly. Mm. And so the three step for North Korea, freeze first, mm. uh, reducing the capability second, right, and uh, dismantlement the the, the 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 last. So the last one, the three steps, they cover totally different. But the, the last one is the same: dismantlement versus dismantlement. But uh, starting from the freeze or starting from the ver, ver, uh, de declaration, right. that is quite a substantive. That's not a uh, technical issue. It's a uh, political and the strategic and the security issue. For North Korea, uh, they argued, mm. we are remain in the state of war, we are remain in the relationship for enemy, right. how I can declare our top secret, how many warheads, how many materials we have. So here is the thing, Mr. Walsh, you listen to your two colleagues, it's a matter of fact, okay, that both sides talk about the denuclearization, that's true of the Korean Peninsula, but the approach they're taking is certainly different and the approach is not just the approach itself but rather strategy and the end goal in a way as well. So uh, Mr. Walsh is now a reflection of this huge difference in nature to begin with with the re latest tension. Meanwhile, will both sides be able and afford to adjust the so-called approach differences as time goes on when U.S. is running into really big political season in which the DPRK issue could be a big political capital for President Trump to seek re-election politically and also in the DPRK if you see the situation, drought, uh, poverty and other issues continue uh, for the stability of the governance. Uh, Mr. Walsh. Well, I guess my short answer to both your questions is yes. Yes, this moment in time does reflect the differences the two sides have. Just to give an illustration, another illustration, the U.S. continues to emphasize economic benefits for North Korea. The president did this in his tweet. You know, you'll be rich and, and fat and happy, but that doesn't address North Korea's security hmm. concerns. And we know from the Putin summit, Kim Putin summit, there has to be a way to address if... North Korea were to disarm and be left defenseless, what guarantee would it have that it would survive as a country? So yeah. the U.S. has not been very good about talking about the security side of the equation. You are absolutely right again, yes, uh, that, the, the, that this moment reflects uh, that and, and that going forward there's a real question here. So, so the North Koreans have sort of pulled back, which is their way after Hanoi, that was to be expected. Yeah. But they also seem to have a different strategy. Their strategy was sort of get Trump in the room deal with him one-on-one, -on -one. don't go through all these working groups and all the rest of it, you know, get him in a room and get him to sign on to a good agreement. Mm. And that didn't work in Hanoi. And so both saw, and, and frankly, the U.S. hasn't been very good about pressing for negotiations. I mean, okay. after Singapore, you know, nothing happened. And now after Hanoi, nothing's happened. They have mm. to meet, you know, in Geneva, in Beijing, they have to do the dirty work the hard work of diplomacy, and as you suggested, Very in the question, it has to start sooner rather than later. What you're saying? It has to start now. Because those things the that clock have not been ticking. done will always come back and haunt us, don't they? And they are right now. So, Mr. Yes. Young, yes. go to you very briefly, of course, uh, before the other two guests. Uh, what can be done, and what can the other parties do, and what should be the DPRK and Washington be able to respond? to the latest increasing tension, at least apparently, Mr. Yang. Very briefly, an answer from you, sir. Well, resuming the talks without any uh, preconditions for, explore, uh, for exploring yes. mutually accepted uh, compromise uh, about the differences I mentioned above. But, but how? I mean, how would they be able to resume a dialogue when you are having tensions like this, a test and the, 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 the Twitter and the, the test more and the Twitter more? So. I don't see the possibility, Mr. Yang. You probably I could borrow some wisdom from you very briefly, sir. Once again, well, uh, dialogues uh, will prov uh, provide the opportunities to find a compromising way. Uh. Uh, by the air exchanges, no way to find a solution. I see. And Mr. Wash, you got some positive wisdom for us too. I think, Mr. Well, I think Mr. Young's wisdom is good enough for me. They need to sit in a room and negotiate. Now, you say there are problems in the relationship. Yes, there are always problems in a relationship when adversaries, yes. enemies, 
are trying to sit down <laughs> and negotiate. That's just the way it is. And so they're going to have to ignore that and do the hard work of diplomacy. So I'm, I'm with Mr. Young on this. All right. And Ms. Tao? Well, I mean, that, that is exactly the goal of diplomacy, is, is to be able to talk about the hard issues and reduce tensions. The problem, I think, that, that really lies at the heart of this is that in the U.S. approach to this issue, again, while we have a new approach, we have Trump negotiating one-on-one -on -one with Kim Jong-un, mm. the problem is we keep coming back with the same old proposition. And until the U.S. is ready to actually accept a different approach, um, one that does take into consideration the security concerns, that does take the time to build the relationship of trust um, while we're working towards denuclearization. Right. Um, as long as we continue this all or nothing approach, we're not going to get very far and the North Koreans aren't going to come back to the table. So I think, you know, we really need to come to terms with what it is that is in the U.S. best interest. And right. if that is denuclearization, there is a path towards denuclearization, but it, it means that we have to accept um, a, a different approach to mm. it as well, and we're not going to get all, all of it up front. You know what? When it comes to real world, wishful thinking never gets us there. There has to be a lot of hard work and sometimes compromise, no matter how difficult they are. They always eventually serve a much bigger and better purpose. For now, I want to thank the three of you. I mean, I've been having you guys on the program over and over again at very difficult and critical times <laughs> of the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue. And every time talking to you, there's certainly wisdom that can be learned. Thank you once again for your insights. Yang Shi Yu, Jenny Tao, last but not least, Jim Wash. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. Still to come on our program. Green is in at the recently opened Beijing Horticultural Expo. Stories of nature's beauty and bounty right after this break. Right here. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Live green, live better. That's the Beijing Expo's motto and theme for the horticultural expo being going on here in the city. It's seen throughout this place focusing on sustainable practices. Exploring the expo is like traveling around the world. Earlier, I toured the International Pavilion, one of the event's biggest attractions, bearing in mind the relationship between human beings and Mother Nature. Take a look. Nature does not hurry, yet it accomplishes all. That is believed to be said by Lao Tzu, an ancient Chinese philosopher more than 2,500 years ago. It is illustrating the beautiful relationship between human beings and nature. 2,500 years later, at the foot of the Great Wall in China, the International Horticultural Exposition is being held, with more than 100 different countries participating People from all over the world are trying to gather together and articulate their current understanding of their relationship with the grand nature. Many of them are holding exhibitions inside the International Pavilion, the beautiful architecture right behind me. For example, here I'm in the Germany Pavilion, and I have a friend, Harik, coming from the northwestern part of Germany here, help us to understand better. So what's going on here? It seems a lot of projects at the same time. Yes, well, this is just one project. Yeah. Uh, we have an example right here. It's uh, from the west of Germany, from the rural area, and it is about renaturalizing the uh, former industrial area into a green habitat. So have you ever visited there? I have been there actually and uh, visited a museum that's also at the site and I also went down a mine 
and we're over here you can uh, actually take a ride down the elevator into the mine and see what fossils you will find along the way. And what about this? This is a place I'm always fascinated about. Yes, that is something as I have to show you. That is a typical cabin in, for us in Germany. Yeah. We have in our so-called Schrebergarten. Those are small gardens we have that are a little outside of the city and those are for the city people. So the city people don't have enough space uh, in the city to have their own garden. Yes. And so this is their chance to have a garden, to plant flowers, mm -hmm. to maybe even have their own herds. National pavilions like that of are scattered around the 503 hectares of land here in the exposition park. Some are rather familiar countries, while other countries remain mysterious. I'm right now standing in front of the DPRK Pavilion. The sculpture right behind me certainly is showing the aspiration for peace. Let's go in and check out what's available there. So there's a whole collection of stamps coming from the DPRK, ranging from traditional paintings to the current events. So this is a nice uh, handicraft coming from uh, the, the DPRK, a traditional story about how young couples got to know each other and have a beautiful life. And certainly this is a Kungang Mountain in uh, the DPRK, Mount Kungang. So when you are at the International Horticultural Exposition, where you have people from more than 100 different countries and regions around you, there could always be beautiful surprises. Well, so uh, tea drinking nation, China is, also becoming a huge market for coffee. I explore the journey of both beverages from the plantation to the cup at the Horticultural Experience Pavilion. Take a closer look at that too. They say it is always up to ourselves to live life to the fullest. But the question is how? With more than 100 countries and regions participating in this year's Horticultural Exposition. You bet there are a lot of conversation and discussions about that topic. Today, we're going to take a journey of drinks, a conversation between coffee and tea, and see what kinds of inspirations can we draw from there. This uh, Dong Pao Tea, the king of tea in China. reached its height during the ancient times of the Tang Dynasty in Chinese history. That was also when the classic of tea was born. Since then, tea has become not just the medicine for Chinese lives, but an important drink in the daily life of the Chinese. And of course, when it comes to coffee, it could be a very different story. Compared to tea, coffee, of course, is a latecomer to the Chinese life. But with a lot of curiosity, the Chinese have already embraced the coffee culture. If you look at the exhibit right over here at the Life Experience Pavilion of the International Horticultural Expo, you see different generations of coffee makers.
both coffee and tea have languages of their own. However, when you are sitting here in the beautiful afternoon of the Horticultural Exposition here in Beijing, a natural conversation and dialogue is already taking place between them. Well, with the spring season now in full bloom, it's the best time to visit gardens. Let me take you to a special garden, not your typical beautiful landscape, but rather a patch of green and flowers rich in life and nature with all plants coming from the countries that are active on the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's take a look. They say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. However, when you come into this expo, you realize it's not just the narrow meaning of beauty, but rather how we are interacting with nature and what we can do to bring nature closer to us. They say the best example of that is reflected in this garden right behind me, one designed by a British landscape architect who claims himself to be a crazy conductor of an ensemble of plants. Let's check it out. Hey, James. Hello, it's good, good to, to meet see you. you. Yes, you too. Finally, I see the conductor of this crazy ensemble, as you said, in one of <laughs> the uh, descriptions of your garden. Indeed, yes. yes. Now, my job is to try to make it all behave in an appropriate way. <laughs> but tell us exactly what are the ideas behind this. You know, it looks not necessarily like a typical so-called beautiful garden, but rather a very unique one. Well, I'm glad you said that because I didn't want it to look like a conventional Chinese beautiful garden. <laughs> uh, what I really wanted to look like, there's, there's two ideas yeah. here. One is, it's a sort of, in some ways, it's a metaphor for the Belt and Road Initiative yeah. and about ideas moving east and west, yeah. you know. And secondly, it's about, uh, it's a nature garden. Yes. So it's to try to produce vegetation that looks like uh, you would get, say, in many ways, on a hillside in Beijing. Indeed. And the plants come from different places, yes. obviously. So all of these plants are carefully chosen. Yeah, they're all chosen because we need to produce a long season of flowering interest all the way yeah. through to October. So tell us about some of those pl things and why they are here in your crazy garden. Well, all the, pl the plants here, all the plants in this area here and in this, this gravelly area, yeah. they're all plants from very dry, dry sort of habitats. Like this? Yeah, this, this comes from Southern Europe, for example. Oh, okay. And this comes from Central Asia. Of course. Um, and so, they're, but they're all dry plants. Yeah. And they have different heights, so these flower provides here yeah. uh, and there were bumps and they're, all, they're, they're like three different layers there were bumpy things there were flat things there, yeah. were, there were sticky up things right so you want this different shapes yeah I want to have these Heights. different different sort of lines essentially in, in, in space so you have moundy forms you have things which stick out and then you have things which are really quite yeah. tall and you gather them from different parts of China and also even along the Silk Road along the Silk Road some of these things go all the way to Europe and actually a few of them go beyond Europe I have to really? say Mm. Mm. And, uh, and some of them, uh, you know, some of the things we've, we've, we've gathered ourselves, you know, for, for a seed in China mm. with various nurseries, etc. So yeah. some of them we've actually collected as seed from the wild. Where? Which one? Uh, uh, well, none of the. Uh, well, these ones here. These actually come this from. These from. These come from Inner Mongolia originally. What this, is it called? It's a delphinium. Okay. Has very well, beautiful blue. These names. Beautiful blue flowers. I don't do Chinese common names, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, and and now at the end of the day, they do not look the so-called typical beautiful, well, but they have their own concepts and logic. Well, they're not flowering yet, and of course, beauty is very much in the eye of the beholder. And one, of the, one of the ideas behind the garden is to expose Chinese people to some visual experiences. Yeah. Mm. So like I what kind of visual experience? Well, I mean, Chinese, you know, one of the things, Chinese people love nature outside the city. But when you come to the city, Chinese planting historically is really not very nature-like. Mm. It's essentially much more formalized. And so, it, you know, we'd like to see whether Chinese people will really mm. be able to value in an urban context mm. much more wild-looking vegetation. Right. And of course, uh, when you look at it, the pattern is a unique one. Well, there isn't a planting plan for this sort of planting. So what we do is we use random mixes. Yeah. And so we have a spacing, uh -huh. and plants are just put randomly, so you'll see how things move across. 
they sort of like stitch across <laughs> the space, but they're not in sort of big groups or anything. They mm. are very much in this sort of random order. So the idea is about you have a sustainable garden in a way. Different plants at different time of the year. Well, the idea really is to capture the rhythms of nature. I see. That's Love what it's it. really the way about. You put it. Yeah, I mean, if you go to wi a wild place, it's the rhythm, isn't it, which yes. makes it beautiful. Exactly. And exactly. We're, we're trying to do exactly the same sort of thing in here. I see. Okay. I see. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see the Weibo from me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team. Thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Good night.